Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Clement Tam from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Welcome to this Asia-Pacific Glaucoma Society Masterclass entitled Management of Primary Angle Closure Disease. These are my financial disclosures and also the government funding that has gone into supporting our work on PACG research. Now, in the management of primary angle closure disease, there's, there are three important steps. In the first step, we try to open up all appositionally closed portions of the angle as far as we can. If the intraocular pressure is still uncontrolled, then we start topical medications. And if IOP is still not controlled by maximally tolerated medications, then we consider proceeding to further surgery. There are at least three ways we can use to open up appositionally closed portions of the angle, and these include laser peripheral iridotomy, argon laser peripheral iridoplasty, ALPI, to open up residual appositionally closed segments of the angle after iridotomy, and also finally, lens extraction. Now, the word primary in primary angle closure disease can be misleading because this word usually implies that there are no unknown underlying causes or mechanisms leading to the disease. But in primary angle closure disease, actually there are at least several known mechanisms, and these include pupil block, plateau iris syndrome, lens-related mechanisms, and also possibly choroidal pressures. And the lens-related mechanism may include the anterior posterior position of the lens, the thickness of the lens, as well as acute lens swelling. Now this figure here try to uh, conceptualize the mechanisms leading to angle closure in different eyes. So the x-axis, we've got four uh, separate eyes here, and the height of this column represents the anatomical predisposition to angle closure. You can see that the different colors represent the different mechanisms leading to angle closure. And say, for example, for eye number three here, plateau iris is the main contributing mechanism causing angle closure, whereas in eye number four, the lens thickness is the main mechanism leading to angle closure. And the higher is this column, the greater is the risk of progression along the spectrum of uh, angle closure disease. Now in this uh, second figure here, it looks very similar, but this time it is actually the same eye, but going through different ages. That means uh, uh, at, at different age, uh, at different time points. You can see that with increasing age, there's increasing uh, predisposition to angle closure. And this is very largely because of the increase in lens thickness. And with an increase in lens thickness, there's also uh, possibly an increase in pupillary block component. So the risk of angle closure increases with age and with time. Now in the next two slides, I'll try to summarize a management algorithm for primary angle closure disease based on uh, the type of angle closure. Now in this very first slide, it is a hypothetical situation in which 360 degrees of the angle is completely appositionally closed with ocular hypertension with or without glaucomatous optic neuropathy. In this situation, if you are able to deepen the anterior chamber and widen the drainage angle, chances are that the trabecular measure can be once again accessible to aqueous drainage. So you may not need to do anything further after you have opened up the drainage angle. Now in this situation, if there is visually significant cataract, then you may consider cataract extraction. If there is still persistent appositional angle closure with plateau iris syndrome after the cataract extraction, you may consider argon laser peripheral iridoplasty. On the other hand, if there is no visually significant cataract, you may start with laser peripheral iridotomy to eliminate any pupillary block. If there is persistent appositional angle closure with ocular hypertension after iridotomy, then you have to decide whether plateau iris syndrome or the lens being the main mechanism leading to angle closure, and you have to treat accordingly. Now in this second slide here, this is 
another hypothetical situation in which 360 degrees of the drainage angle is completely sinicularly closed. So this is the other end of the clinical spectrum. Once again, there's ocular hypertension with or without glaucomatous optic neuropathy. So in this scenario, if there is visually significant cataract, then you proceed to cataract extraction. But just by opening up, by, by widening the drainage angle, the peripheral anterior sinecae may still be blocking aqueous drainage. So very likely, you may need another uh, intraocular pressure lowering procedure combined with the cataract extraction in order to bypass the blocked filtration site. And in this situation, you may consider goniosiniculysis, various forms of cyclophotocoagulation. You may consider combining the cataract extraction with mix where appropriate, combining with trabeculectomy, or perhaps even with glaucoma drainage device implantation. In this scenario, if there is no visually significant cataract, then you would have to decide whether the lens is the predominating mechanism leading to angle closure. If it is, you may consider lens extraction, once again, with or without another IOP lowering surgery. If the lens is not the main contributing mechanism, then you may proceed with one, other, with one of these IOP lowering surgery with or without lens extraction. Now, based on this algorithm, very often we would have to decide whether plateau iris or the lens being the main mechanism leading to angle closure. And how do we decide? Now, there are at least two important pieces of evidence supporting plateau iris syndrome. And these include seeing the double hump sign during darkroom gonioscopy, and also seeing the characteristic plateau iris anatomical configuration during ultrasound bowel microscopy. Now in this dark room gonioscopic view of this particular drainage angle, you can see that there is no trabecular meshwork structures visible. So the drainage angle is closed. And this is after a laser peripheral iridotomy. The next step, you would need to do a dark room indentation gonioscopy in order to distinguish between sinecule or appositional angle closure. Now with indentation, you can see that now the trabecular meshwork is, is uh, reviewed with the angle opened. And so this is a case of a positional angle closure. And the other very important feature you can see here is what we would call the double hump sign. You can see that the, there's a, the iris is raised up over here. There's a, there's a small hill over here, and then it dips down into a valley. And then it once again rises up over another small hill before it dips into the, into the drainage angle. So it is in the form of a double hump. And the reason for this double hump is because more centrally, the iris is being draped over a very prominent and anteriorly positioned lens. And then it drapes over the, uh, the periphery of the lens. And finally, it rises up again all over a very anteriorly positioned and prominent ciliary body. So this is characteristic of plateau iris syndrome. Now in the UBM images, uh, in the upper image here, you can see a very prominent and anteriorly positioned ciliary body, which is pushing the peripheral iris towards the drainage angle, towards the inner surface of the cornea. And uh, in the upper UBM image here, the eye is actually in a lighted room with the pupil in a relatively constricted stage. And, and so you can see that the angle is still open, even though narrowly. But in the bottom figure, this is now in a dark adapted state with the pupil relatively dilated, and the iris is now bunched up towards the drainage angle, which closes off the drainage angle. Now with plateau iris syndrome, argon laser peripheral iridoplasty is a useful technique. This technique involves the placement of contraction laser burns onto the peripheral of the iris. And the, the, the typical laser parameters used would include a very large spot size of about 500 to 1000 microns, a relatively longer duration of about 0.5 seconds. And usually for brown iris, we start from a very low power of 150 to 250 milliwatts and titrate according to what uh, we see at the iris. For lighter iris, we may use 
a smaller spot size of 200 microns, and also we may need to start with a higher power of 200 to 300 milliwatts. Now, sometimes in some texts, it, uh, it is described uh, 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 to use a much smaller spot size, shorter duration, as well as much higher power for these uh, iridoplasty uh, laser burns. Please do not use these because with such laser settings, especially in brown iris, you cause these small charred uh, burning of the iris without good iris stromal contraction. Furthermore, in this particular photo here, the laser spots is also being applied too centrally, too far away from the peripheral part of the iris. And so in this particular situation, the iridoplasty is very unlikely to work. Now, while you apply the laser peripheral iridoplasty, if there is no iris stromal contraction visible, then you increase the laser power. Alternatively, if you see bubble formation, iris charring, or pigment release into the anterior chamber, or if you, if you hear a pop sound, then you decrease the laser power. Normally, we apply about 20 to 24 laser spots over 360 degrees of the iris. We avoid large visible radial blood vessels as far as we can, and also do not place the laser spots too closely to each other, because otherwise there's an increased risk of iris necrosis and atrophy. Now this is a video demonstrating the placement of iris contraction burns in the far periphery of the iris. You can see that as soon as the laser spot is applied, there is contraction of the iris towards the laser application site. There's also thinning of the iris stroma at that point, and also deepening of the anterior chamber at that particular position. And this serves to widen the drainage angle as well as pull, mechanically pulls open the positionally closed drainage angle. So this is a very de good demonstration of an effective laser iridoplasty. Normally this is performed under topical anesthesia and my own personal preference is to use the Abraham contact lens. Now this UBM image demonstrates that when the laser contraction burns is applied to the correct position, there's good iris stromal thinning, which leads to opening, widening of the drainage angle uh, at this uh, critical position with subsequent opening of the drainage angle by an effective iridoplasty laser contraction. Now, by far, I think the most common reasons why iridoplasty sometimes do not work is because it is not applied peripherally enough. Now, you, on the left-hand side here, you can see that the laser in this particular eye, the laser is very well placed in the far periphery of the iris, and there's good iris stromal contraction and thinning, and so the angle is reopened. But on the right-hand side here, the laser spot is being applied too centrally. So even with the iris stromal contraction, there's no opening of the drainage angle here. Now, apart from argon laser peripheral iridoplasty, in fact, endoscopic cyclophotocoagulation may also have a role in managing plateau iris syndrome. Now, this is a laser technique that involves the direct visualization of the ciliary processes with an endoscope in the anterior chamber. And when we applied, laser burns to the ciliary epithelium, you can see a contraction of all these ciliary processes. And um, this is also effective. This has also been shown to be effective in opening up their positionally closed angles from uh, in the eyes with a plateau iris syndrome. Now, what about the clinical evidence supporting lens mechanism as, as the main contributing factor towards angle closure? Of course, there are all these uh, quantitative anterior segment anatomical parameters that you can measure uh, with uh, ultrasound biomicroscopy or anterior segment OCT. But up to today, these are still largely uh, for research purposes. Whereas in the clinical setting, I think by far the most important uh, evidence would be seeing, would, would be the evaluation of the central anterior chamber death at the slit lamp. This is because the central anterior chamber death is the combined outcome of both the anterior posterior position of the lens as well as the lens thickness. So in an eye with a very shallow central anterior chamber, 
uh, the, the lens is very likely to be a major contributing factor towards angle closure. And by removing the lens, we would significantly deepen the anterior chamber and widen the drainage angle in such an eye. And the other sign is actually what I would call the Mount Fujiyama sign. This is when you're looking from an angle towards the anterior segment of the eye. For example, when using a gonioscope, you can see that the configuration of the iris and as well as the pupil takes on the appearance of a volcano. You can see that um, this is particularly looking like a volcano when the pupil is in a more constricted state. And the reason for this is because the iris is being draped over a very anteriorly positioned as well as prominent anterior lens surface. Now, just now, when we were talking about the management algorithm, we mentioned that uh, sometimes with lens extraction or cataract extraction alone, it is not sufficient, and we may need to combine it with other IOP lowering surgery. So what would be my personal choice for this other IOP lowering surgery? Before I move on to that, first of all, um, we know that lens extraction is often the first intervention of choice in primary angle closure disease, especially when visually significant cataract is present, and also when the lens is considered a major contributing factor to angle closure and intraocular pressure reduction is required. But lens extraction alone may not be sufficient if there is very advanced glaucomatous optic neuropathy necessitating a very low target intraocular pressure or when there is grossly uncontrolled intraocular pressure. Now, this figure here shows my own personal lens extraction treatment spectrum. Uh, but usually for eyes in which you don't need a, a, a large extent of IOP reduction, I'm, I may perform just phaco emulsification alone. If I need more IOP or drug reduction, then I consider combining it with phaco, uh, combining phaco with endoscopic cyclophotocoagulation. Of course, this is my own personal choice, and there are other options that are available that we have touched on earlier on. And then finally, if I want more or less maximum IOP reduction, then I'll do combined phacotropic electomy. You can see that as we move from left to right in this treatment spectrum, there is increasing IOP reduction, but at the same time, there's also increasing invasiveness, increasing surgical risk, as well as increasing surgical time. Now, endoscopic cyclophotocoagulation uh, involves the placement of diode laser burns of continuous wave energy at 810 nanometers uh, uh, during direct visualization of the ciliary processes. Now, this animation here shows you how this procedure is done. Usually, when it is combined with cataract extraction after lens implantation, you can deepen the anterior chamber with viscoelastic. Then with the endoscope in the anterior chamber, you can directly visualize the ciliary processes, and then you can apply laser over the ciliary processes. As soon as the laser is applied, there is whitening of the ciliary epithelium and also contraction of the ciliary processes. And it is very important that we try to apply, uh, to, to cover the complete epithelial service uh, with the, 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 the laser marks. You can see that the whitening needs to cover the ciliary processes, all of the ciliary processes, as well as the valleys in between the ciliary processes. Now, this is a pilot randomized controlled trial that we have conducted in Hong Kong, comparing phacal emulsification alone versus combined phacal ECP in PACG eyes. The orange line here represents those eyes, the mean intraocular pressure of those eyes treated with phaco ECP over a course of 24 months after the initial surgery, while the blue line represents the mean intraocular pressure of those eyes treated by phaco emulsification alone. Now in this second figure, now we are looking at the mean number of drugs required by these eyes. And once again, the orange line re represents those eyes treated by phaco ECP, while the blue line represents those eyes treated by phaco emulsification alone. Now this very similar graph is actually from another 
a much earlier randomized control trial conducted by our group comparing phaco emulsification alone versus combined phaco trabecolectomy in medically uncontrolled primary angle closure glaucoma eyes with coexisting cataract. And you can see that just by performing the phaco emulsification alone, there's a very good intraocular pressure reduction, which is maintained well over 24 months. Uh, with combined phaco trabecolectomy, there is additional IOP lowering. And this uh, additional benefit is also well maintained over at least 24 months after surgery. And if you look at the drug requirements for these eyes, once again, with phaco emulsification alone, there is very good drug reduction, whereas with combined phaco trabecolectomy, uh, there's additional reduction in drug requirements, which is also well maintained over at least 24 months after surgery. Now in this table here, I'm trying to compare a phaco emulsification versus combined phaco ECP and also phaco trabecolectomy in PACGIs. First of all, I must acknowledge that this is not a scientific comparison because I'm now pooling the data from two completely separate and independent randomized controlled trials. But at least I think this table should give you a rough idea as to how these three procedures compare with each other. In terms of mean IOP reduction at two years after surgery, FACO emulsification reduces IOP by over 21%, FACO ECP by over 27%, while, while combined FACO trabecolectomy reduced IOP very significantly by well over 40%. In terms of drug reduction, FACO emulsification reduces IOP by over 32%, FACO ECP reduces IOP by over 48%, while FACO trabecolectomy reduces IOP by over 80%. 3%. But of course, with combined phacal trabeculectomy, it is a much more invasive and much more major surgery compared to the other two. And so it is associated with a greater risk of surgical complications, both intraoperatively and postoperatively. Whereas with phacal emulsification alone, there's a greater chance that additional filtration surgery would be required within two years after the first intervention as compared to phaco ECP or phaco trabecolectomy. So this table summarizes very well uh, our, uh, my own personal lens extraction treatment spectrum, pro progressing from phaco emulsification to pro phaco ECP to combined phaco trabecolectomy with increasing intraocular pressure reduction, as well as increasing invasiveness, surgical risk and time when we move from left to right. Now, in making our final surgical decision, there are at least two very important factors we have to consider. The very first question we have to ask is how much IOP and or drug reduction is required? Of course, to answer this question, we have to look at the preoperative IOP and the number of drugs the patient is on before surgery. The glaucoma stage, as well as the, the target IOP has also to be taken into consideration. And of course, the patient's age and the rate of glaucomatous progression must be considered as well. The second question we have to answer is how much surgical risk the patient and the surgeon can accept. Of course, to answer this question, we have to look at the status of the operated eye as well as the fellow eye. For example, if this is the only eye of the patient, the patient may be reluctant to under uh, to undergo interventions with higher risk of surgical complications. Furthermore, we have to look at the patient, patient's visual requirement, which includes the patient's work as well as hobbies. I think at the end of the day, it is extremely important that we give sufficient seat time to our patients and to thoroughly discuss the pros, cons, and risk of these different procedures with our patients before arriving at a final surgical decision with our patient. If you would like to read more about primary angle closure glaucoma, we have this textbook entitled Primary Angle Closure Glaucoma, A Logical Approach in Management, which is uh, edited by myself and co-authored by a constellation of very distinguished clinician scientists from our region working on this disease. It is published by Springer and is now available on the Springer online shop, as well as on Amazon.com and many major booksellers.
Finally, let me bring your attention to the 5th Asia Pacific Glaucoma Congress, which will be held from the 4th to the 8th of June this year. But if you are interested in contents other than glaucoma, then please do mark your diary for the APAO 2021, which is the first ever completely virtual APAO Congress from the 5th to the 11th of September, 2021. Thank you very much for your kind attention and time. And I very much look forward to discussing primary angle closure glaucoma with you in the next discussion session. Thank you once again.